I've been here for um, almost uh, four years now uh, in May. Um, I have uh, cover uh, my, my current role is a migration specialist, uh, but I've done uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things, especially with storage partners and, and backup partners uh, in the past. So um, I'm going to go off video because um, this is not about me. This is about uh, talking more about backup and and and, and restore architectures in the cloud. Uh, so I do have so I've got a, I've got a number of slides. I kind of want to set the stage. I've also got a demo that I'm going to uh, that I'm going to kind of take you through. Um, we're going to talk mainly about our AWS backup product uh, or our AWS backup service. Um, and I'm not sure where everybody is in terms of just in terms of um, you know what you know about the service. So I'm gonna we are gonna kind of start from the ground up a bit. Um, if uh, just just to make sure that either uh, that attendees on the call or I, I see this meeting is, is being recorded, just to make sure that everybody's got kind of a um, kind of kind of a, the, the same footing. So let me go ahead and share my screen. We're also gonna talk about some other some other pieces as well, not just uh, specific to AWS backup because. Uh, there's disaster recovery that we need to take into account as well, right? Um, but I can definitely share some of my experiences and share what I've been seeing a lot um, with customers, right? Like, so what are we as solution architects? What are some of the customer challenges we're seeing uh, from our customers a lot, right? I think that's a lot more in interesting than just, hey, this is AWS backup. Have a nice day. Um, but I'll use these slides as kind of a guide uh, just to kind of get us through there so I'm not rambling on the entire time. <clears throat> I do see that my oh there we go chime is chime finally woke up, um, and yeah here we go so okay so um so no so AWS backup so so what is AWS backup uh, so it's a service that launched uh, a, a few years ago um, and it started off pretty small right um, allowing customers to uh, to have an AWS native uh, service uh, to protect um, certain AWS services. So uh, quick to note is AWS Backup doesn't support all of our 200 plus services, right? Uh, it's uh, it's constantly expanding, but um, but today it it, uh, it protects a number of services, uh, services like uh, Amazon EC2, uh, EBS, uh, FSx uh, family, um, Although not all FSx file systems are supported, there's FSx uh, FSx for Windows mainly, EFS, um, RDS, Aurora, and Dynamo, uh, and then there's application consistency um, within within AWS Backup uh, for for Windows systems. And why application consistency matters is um, because it's basically quiescing the application. So if you've got a database that's running, for example, right, a, a SQL database on a Windows server, and you're going to take a snapshot, which is which is the me mechanism that I, AWS Backup primarily uses to protect systems. Uh, if you take a snapshot while the database is running and still taking transactions, you're either going to get transactions lost in flight, um, or you may have you may you may have uh, what we call a crash consistent backup. So if the machine crashed. Um, in the middle of a transaction, you may lose transactions, and it may maybe uh, you may have to replay that database log, uh, and transactions could get lost. When you take an application consistent backup of that of that database, um, it basically quiesces the database, or it's still running, but it doesn't accept any new transactions, and is pretty much kind of like in a almost like a like a, a frozen state uh, for the most part. But you know, it's not taking the database down; it's just saying I don't want to take any more transactions. Um, until I'm until I'm told otherwise. So it's a great time to take a snapshot. So when you recover that snapshot, it's going to be to the same. Uh, it, it's not going to have. You'll have consistency in terms of your records. Um, so AWS Backup today um, does support uh, also supports uh, VMware, um, and we'll get into that in a, a little bit. So what that does is that really starts opening up uh, being able to make use of AWS Backup in a hybrid uh, hybrid sort of a scenario right we're seeing customers yes we do have a lot of customers that are um native to aws but a lot of a lot of our larger com customers and even some of our smaller customers right um i was working with a customer last week that uh, has a very small footprint on aws and still wants to be able to protect on-prem uh, but also protect aws um so having that capability to kind of uh, use a single tool is, is very attractive for our customers 
Um, so I'm not going to get too much into the backup challenges, um, you know, but but there are challenges. I mean, prior to AWS backup, um, it was it was not an easy task to be to have a to have a central place to manage your e, your EBS and your RDS backups, right? Um, RDS backups, uh, there are automatic RDS backups, and those get scheduled one way. EBS backups, there's Data Lifecycle Manager, which works and still works great, um, but it's just it's just if you're a backup administrator, right, and you're and you're scheduling backups, so you need to add schedules to this. It's just a lot of additional overhead that you have to do, right? Uh, the, the nice piece about AWS Backup it is it's a single console where you can manage all your backups and manage a single policy, for example, if you wanted to, or have multiple policies, and you can have have that done across services, um, which is really nice. Um, so I talked a little bit about some of the services in, in the previous slide. So now, now let's talk a little bit more about how AWS Backup works. And here's here's the current slide in terms of what um, what AWS Backup supports. Uh, we add, we're constantly adding new services uh, to the AWS Backup portfolio. I know Neptune is one of the recent entrants um, as well. Uh, but basically, what you're going to do, and I'll, I'll show you a bit more in the demo, is you're creating uh, you're creating a backup plan, right? Um, and a backup plan um, is basically that that plan that that tells you um, when am I backing up, when am I backing up, when am I backing it up, how long is it going to stick around for, uh, and items like that. What what services do I care about, right? Um, do I just want to have a single plan for just my EBS volumes, or do I want to have something that uh, spans everything? Do I want to have different plans based on retention policies? Maybe prod backups stick around for a year, uh, non-prod stick around for 30 days. Um, those are all requirements based. And and you know where I start seeing a lot of challenges with customers is well, you know some of their some of them would ask me like, hey, what? So what should I? What should? How long should I keep this around for? And it's like, well, I can't tell you that. Not, not as a not as a solutions architect. I can tell you how to set it. But it's really based on business requirements, right? So we should never be, you know, I, I never want to be pre prescriptive with customers in terms of saying, hey, you should keep everything around for seven years um, because not everything needs to be around for seven years, right? I mean, it's it's expensive to keep things around for seven years. But at the flip side, you want to, you don't want to say, you don't want to be the guy that says, hey, just keep it around for 30 days and you'll be fine when they may have regulatory requirements that state otherwise. So um, definitely sometimes have to battle is just helping the customer defining the policies and de defining exactly what they need, if that makes sense. Um, there's also some notification pieces here in terms of uh, logging like CloudTrail, uh, SNS um, and whatnot. Um, there's also support with AWS backup for organizations. Uh, organizations is continuing to be uh, a pretty large component of where we're uh, putting our customers to now, right? So um, just in terms of multi-account strategy, um, gone are the days when we just want to have customers with a single or two AWS accounts. Um, where, you know, if you look at a, at, a, at a solution like Control Tower, for example, right? Um, that's something that's going to help them not only get set up with organizations, but help set them up with some services and some guardrails um, and single sign-on and whatnot. So um, it's something we're really steering customers towards. And AWS Backup is is basically it basically supports you know help, helping customers have some visibility throughout their organization, um, but also you know take take some of that uh, heavy lifting out with managing backups across organizations. And lastly, we'll talk later more about the the backup vault. Uh, the backup vault is really nothing more than uh, a logical uh, a logical place where these backups are stored. Uh, they're still stored technically with the service. So, I mean, if you think about EBS, for example, AWS Backup is just orchestrating EBS snapshots. It's not taking it's 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 taking it it's taking snapshots. It's not doing anything different. We're not we're not installing an agent on the EC2 instance. It's just orchestrating snapshots. But where it's stored really matters. Um, so. Um, even though it's still stored as a regular EBS snapshot uh, from a data plane perspective, from a control plane perspective, um, you know we interact with that snapshot differently because the AWS backup service uh, stores it there. So, uh, and and that's and and we'll get into that more when we talk about backup vaults and and what they are and and why they're important. But um, they're a real key concept, especially when you start talking about things like ransomware. Uh, and then lastly, we have uh, IAM um, and some compliance reporting features here. So. You know, maybe not everybody in your organization needs access to the backup console, uh, whether it be read-only access, whether it be full access. Uh, this goes back to the just a simple granularity of things like IAM. 
Um, and then you've got some compliance reporting pieces in there as well, right? Just saying, hey, did my backups run? Um, that sort of thing. So um, I'm going to be sharing this deck after this. So I I don't want you all to worry about uh, this this eye chart here. I'm just kind of showing you know some of the different features that we have within some of the services. Uh, and you know, the biggest key point, uh, the biggest takeaway here on this slide is that there is a there is a uh, section called life cycle to cold storage right in the middle there. And you'll, you'll notice that only two of those, two of the services, VMware Cloud on AWS and EFS um, are, are supported there. Uh, actually, I think that's out of date. I think we've also got that for Dynamo DB now as well. Uh, but what that means is that for customers, if you have long-term retention policies, right? Like let's say you need, to, you, need, you need to have your EFS backups out there for a year or longer, right? Um, if you've got two storage tiers, right? You've got a hot storage tier and a cold storage tier, um, you could store these backups in colder storage um, and you'll be paying less you know, rather than if you were storing it in, in a warmer storage class, um, it's different than an SD, S3 storage class. This is backup storage, but you'd be, you'll basically be storing it in colder backup storage. So your, your costs will reduce as a result there. Um, here's just a continuation of that um, with some of the life cycling to cold storage uh, as well. So some of the use cases, cloud native backups. Yes, I mean, uh, I can tell you as a migration solutions architect, um, I see customers who migrate to the cloud all the time. And uh, unfortunately, the last thing that they're thinking about are things like backups. Um, so it's something that it's probably the first question I ask, what's your backup strategy? You, you wanna move to AWS, great, we're happy to have you. How are you gonna protect your your, your systems once they're in AWS? Uh, you're, you're moving your, or if they're modernizing, right? They're going from, they're running an Oracle database today on EC2. And they're going. They want to go to RDS, um, where they want to. They want to switch completely, and they want to go to say Aurora with MySQL. Um, their backups. Their backups are going to have to change as a result of that, right? Um, and th how they think about and manipulate backups is also different. As, uh, different with that as well. So, um, you know, there's there's the backup piece, there's the compliance piece, and then there's the disaster recovery piece. And we'll get to disaster recovery a little a little bit later. Because uh, disaster recovery can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, right? Um, when we think of disasters, a, 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 and it, it's all organization specific, right? If we think about, you know, a, a region with three availability zones, a, a customer can, could, could consider an AZ outage um, to be a disaster, to be enough to declare a disaster and want to recover somewhere else. Where that somewhere else is up to them. Do they want to recover in a separate availability zone? Do they want to recover in a region across the country, across the globe? Can they? Um, you know, how much time would it take them to to do that? I mean, how how you know is it, is it like an online type business where if they're like an online pharmacy and they can't accept transactions anymore, then their customers can't order medication, or is it something like, or or is it, or, or is it something a little more a little less mundane than that? Um, so these are all. You know, the key here is is less you know the mechanism you know in terms of hey this this is the this is the how you know a lot of this you know when it comes to backups and and you know what makes sense the most for customers is what are their requirements and um, that and and starting to really dig dig in with customers on what those requirements are in my opinion is probably half the battle once you have those requirements clearly delineated you can kind of help them understand what they need to back up how long it needs to stick around for and also how they would recover that in the event of an outage or some sort of a of a large scale event um yes aws backup meets the challenges um, i'm going to go through some of these uh, so i want to talk a little bit more about this because it says I, I understand that you know i the the you know what's a I, I use the term control plane and data plane before so I want to kind of just top on this slide right so the control plane is really the orchestration layer right it's it's that scheduling layer for example right it's it's, it's scheduling it's monitoring it's reporting no data actually resides in the control plane right and if it does it's metadata so it's um you know it, it, it it's um it, it's dates and time it's date, date timestamps. Uh, more than anything else the data is actually data plane is more of where the backups are actually stored so if we look at something like aws backup AWS backup is really acting as a control plane 
when it comes to backups, right? It's not actually storing the data. Nothing is actually stored in AWS backup with most services. A little different when we're th looking at things like EFS. Uh, that's kind of a kind of a different thing there because EFS doesn't have a native backup capability, whereas e EBS does, right? Uh, EBS, RDS all have native snapshot cap capability. So AWS backup is really just act acting as an orchestration layer and an additional management layer on top of that. So that's really the, the difference between control plane and data plane. Um, I haven't heard of these prior to coming to AWS. I've been been in the industry for over 20 years. Nobody's ever said control plane or data plane to me before. If you're interested in getting into AWS deeper, it's very helpful for you to, to know these because people are going to start using these terms more and more, and, and this is just a helpful place to call it out. So this next slide kind of talks about um, snapshots, right? Um, I, I think this is a good, I, I think a lot of people um, also within AWS get confused on what a snapshot actually is, right? Um, and, you know, why, why it's useful, right? So, uh, so a snapshot, um, if let's, we think about an EBS volume, for example, right? A snapshot, uh, when you think a snapshot of that EBS volume, um, and we think of that incremental backup here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, that snapshot is really, um, it's going to be a point in time copy of the data that is on that device. So um, so if you've got an EBS volume that's 100 gigabytes and only 50% of it is used, you, you've only got 50 gigabytes of data on there, That's that initial snapshot is going to contain 50 gigabytes of data. Everything else, uh, it, it's smart enough to only only read you know, the written blocks. Everything else is just, um, everything else is, isn't there. So why does this matter? This matters for, for two perspectives. One from a cost perspective, right? So even though you, you're paying for 100 gig uh, EBS volume, you're only paying for a 50 gig snapshot, right? Because we charge per we, we charge per gig uh, on the snapshot. So that's 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 very nice, right? Uh, and then we start taking okay, well that, that's your first snapshot, and then your 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 next snapshot is that initial incremental it's taken five minutes later, five hours, or five days later, or you know, time time really isn't you know where this this next one when this one next one comes in this incremental backup one doesn't really matter the time as long as that initial backup is still sticking around once you take that that incremental snapshot um if only five percent of that that volume has changed right uh, five percent of that volume's data has changed you're, it's only going to be backing up that delta so if you started with 50 gigs on your initial backup and you've only changed five gigs um, or added five gigs for example right your incremental backup is going to be five gigabytes. So um, why, why does this matter? Um, in addition to cost, if you ever had to restore, you know, and this is this shows over, over time, right? Um, but if you ever had to restore, let's say you started your initial backup on Sunday, right? And Monday is your incremental backup one. Uh, let's, let's keep the rest of these, um, let, let's not worry about the rest of these for now. But if you wanted to restore back from Monday's backup, what you'd basically be, rest be restoring back is, You'd be restoring back the um, the initial uh, the, the the data from the initial that 50 gigabytes from the initial, but also that five gigabytes uh, that's the incremental, um, and all in a single point in time, right? You're not going to have to worry about restoring both. You would restore that incremental backup one, which was taken Monday. That's your point in time from Monday's snapshot or or backup, um, and that's going to be smart enough to basically combine the data from your initial backup as well as your incremental backup. And that's the same the same truth here if it was if you were storing from incremental backup 5 uh, which which would happen on a Friday, right? Your Friday is your point in time, you you recover from your Friday point in time backup. It's going to restore all this data. You don't have to worry about restoring each each every single one of these individually. The service is smart enough to know what it's got to do to basically pull all that data together. Uh, that's kind of the magic behind the scenes. Uh, but that that's really powerful for customers to know. Um, also, because in the cloud things work differently. Uh, if you've if you've worked with backups in the past, uh, especially tape backups, you may be, be familiar with the concept of weekly fulls, daily incrementals. Well, um, that kind of gets thrown on its head here because there is no such you know, the only the initial is your full. So if you wanted to do weekly fulls, there's really no way to do that um, in AWS backups. Um, you can take weekly backups, of course, and you can retain them for as long as you want, but they won't be fulls. They'll always be point in times. Another another interesting thing to note is if this initial backup gets removed for whatever reason, right? Like it's get recycled out, it's deleted. 
what will end up happening is this data is going to get written to the next backup in the sequence. So if we just X out this, this initial backup, um, your incremental backup one is now going to be considered your initial full, right? And this is all stuff that happens really behind the scenes and, and might be confusing. So you don't, you don't need to know this, but I just figured, you know, um, it, it's helpful just to kind of know what happens behind the scenes um, because especially from a cost perspective, right? It's like, well, this initial backup is costing me a lot of money. So let me go ahead and delete it. Well, you can, but you, know, you can delete that backup, but that data is going to get written to the next, to the next snapshot in the chain. So it's not really going to save you anything uh, because you still need in order to have the integrity of the backup chain, you want to, you know, it, it needs to make sure that there's an initial backup. So it's smart enough to know that. Um, Let's see. Um, let's see. I'm seeing some questions. Uh, RPO and RTO requirements. Yes, that's also uh, very big. And we'll, we'll talk a little, a little bit more about RTO and RPO uh, when we talk disaster recovery. Uh, so snapshot, yes, is just a save state. Uh, mul multiple backups let, left you, let you have different points to roll back to, yes. And that's where, where really recovery re recovery points come, come to, right? You can have a, a nightly backup, for example, right? Once every 24 hours. And then if you if, if something goes south, um, let's say you have a backup every every night at one, uh, every night at 11 o'clock at night. Um, if for some some reason something went south on that system at 10 o'clock at night, right? You would be restoring from the previous nights. So if you can, you if you're okay with a up to 24 hour recovery point objective, then that situation is fine. But if you want to have backup, say every four hours or every 12 hours, uh, that that's that's different. So then you would want to go into AWS Backup and schedule that, um, schedule that accordingly. Uh, and again, it's just you know, especially with, with these. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, if if there's no changes every four hours, then you're not going to be paying more for it. But if there are, then you'll pay for whatever those deltas are um, throughout those those guys there. Um, so backup policies, I, I, I'd rather just show you a demo um, you know, in terms of how that's going to go, just kind of show you in terms of if you create backup plans. Talk, talk a little bit more about this log, this backup vaults, um, you know, just, just in terms of that concept with AWS backup. It is nothing more than a logical construct. Um, and I do see that Chime is a bit laggy, so I'm going to hold on and let Chime catch up to me. So, all right, cool. So AWS Backup, yes, Backup Vault is a logical co construct for additional security. So again, this is more of a, um, th this is where you can store those snapshots in this logical construct that we call a vault, because it's easier to just call it a vault. Uh, but you can encrypt this separately. Uh, you can encrypt your backup separately uh, with a different encryption key. If you'd like, um, you can also protect against deletion. This is super, super, super impo important. Uh, not just again, not just with the Vault Access Policy, but recently we came out with something called Vault Lock. As I don't know if you guys have heard of this before. Uh, you guys are you know, reading the news. You'll probably see one of your favorite companies, or a company that you follow, or some company that at least sounds sounds meaningful to you get hit by a ransomware attack, right? Um, ransomware is the buzz in the back, backup industry now, and customers um, are, are rightly concerned about this, right? And especially when we've got ransomware variants that go out there and go out and delete backup data. Uh, that's That stinks, because usually it's like, oh, I got hit by a ransomware attack. Who cares? I'll just recover from last night's backup and everything will be fine. Well, that's great until that ransomware variant deleted your last night's backup too, right? So. Um, what backup vault lock is, is this basically, uh, this is a, it's essentially a lock, right? And it basically, uh, it, uh, you, can, you can basically give it a minimum time and a maximum time. But you could basically, uh, with this vault lock, you can basically state that your backups need to be, uh, your backups will be locked for a minimum of three days or 30 days. And what that means is if somebody went in there and tried to delete your backups from the vault, uh, and they are they are locked. Um, it's basically going to tell them to, to go fish, uh, and they're not going to be able to do that. Whether that's a ransomware process, whether that's a bad actor, like a like an upset employee saying, uh, "The heck with this place. I'm just going to take everything down with me." Um, you know, any, anything like that. Vault lock really helps protect things like that. Um, thing to really be worried about with something like vault lock, though, is once it's locked. It's locked. So if you go, if, if somebody goes crazy and says, you know, let me, um, I want to lock everything out. I want to lock all my backups up for seven years, 
right? You can you can do that. We don't stop you from doing that. But just keep in mind that those backups are, for all intents and purposes, locked for seven years, um, and you won't be able to to un undo that. Um, this also becomes uh, kind of a kind of an issue with things like uh, the only way these really can be done is if you close your AWS account, and nobody wants to nobody wants to do that. And even then, closing the AWS account isn't going to delete the backups. It's only going to close the account. So you're never really going to be able to rid yourself of that. Um, but you know, just be mindful of, of that because sometimes people may, uh, you know, it's like when you're when you're warm at night. You know, it's it's one thing to put on one blanket, but putting 20 blankets on, you're gonna you're gonna start sweating soon. Uh, so, but but this is really important for customers, and and this is nice that you can now uh, protect your ransomware, protect your 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 systems from ransomware. And there's there's no additional charge for this. Um, right now, it's it does require a CLI command to do it um, uh, in order to enable Vault Lock, um, and I can provide you with some of that uh, later on. So you can't enable Vault Lock through the console, um, but it is something the AWS backup team is looking at making easier to to lock those was up. I'm going to kind of go through this a little quickly just because I'm, I'm seeing time and I, I don't want to stay on slides the entire time. We do have AWS backup for VMware now. So uh, what this means, or VM, what AWS backup for VMware is AWS backup uh, can now protect VMware, whether you're using uh, VMware Cloud on AWS, which is a separate managed service by, by VMware, um, or protect VMware on-premises, right? Um, so Really helpful for some of these customers who require like a hybrid cloud scenario. If you've got VMware running at an edge location, you've got VMware cloud on AWS running running here, um, you can back it up now through a single pane of glass. Uh, this is something that just was announced uh, at reInvent. Um, not get much here. I don't have a VMware environment to test, to test it. Um, here's some of the pricing. Um, here's some of the pricing pieces here. Um, you know, it's it's not you know, backups aren't free, unfortunately. Um, so, it, but you know, th at at the same point, you know, it's AWS, so it's all, all pay as you go, right? So, the, so, uh, and this is where I was talking before about some of the differences between warm storage and cold storage. It's not really showing on that slide, but something like this, if you look at something like EFS, your warm storage is five cents a gig per month, whereas in cold storage, it's one cent per gig per month. Um, and the big difference there is since it's in cold storage. Um, we expect it to be cold. So as a result, your restore charges are going to be are going to be more expensive when you're restoring from cold versus restoring from warm. Um, so it's not really meant to be that kind of storage that you're going to be going back to all the time, because uh, if it is, it should it should basically be in in uh, in more storage. Um, we already know why AWS backup. Uh, a lot of lot, a lot of big name customers are happy with it. Uh, it's live in regions today. Um, and uh, my last piece on AWS backup, and then we're going to kind of switch gears a bit, is test, right? So if you think of something like a evacuation plan, right? Uh, when when you were when you were going to school, or if you're in a corporate office building, right? Um, you you have a fire drill, right? So you know what your you know where your meeting location is, you know the stairway you need to use, and stuff like that. Where I see customers get tripped up a lot is that. Yeah, they 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 they, uh, when they 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 do their backups, but they just don't test, right? Um, they have an idea of what they're going to do, but um, especially as we start seeing some of these really uh, more complex architectures where there's a lot of interdependency between services, like there's they're storing stuff in Dynamo, they're storing stuff in RDS, they've got some state being saved in EC2 as well. Um, you know, and they're just like, ah, if if if, if I need to re recover it, I'll just restore it all at once, and it'll work, right? Uh, well, maybe, um, but will it work the way you expect it to, right? So, I mean, it's easy enough to do the tests now in AWS, um, where you can recover these to a separate AWS account, to a separate region, even the same region, just different resources. But tests make sure that you or your customer has a plan and that you test regularly, right? So. Um, same thing like a fire drill, right? The, the worst, the worst place, worst time to figure out where the fire exit is, is when there's an actual fire event, right? Same thing with backups. Worst time to test your backup plan or your disaster recovery plan is when you're actually having the, the disaster or the backup because um, it, 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 the time, time is essential at that time. Um, let's see. I've got some questions here. Let me sit there. Um, let's see. Where are the resources to take the system backup? Um, 
I can, so so the resources so generally these snapshots are stored in s3 um so so that's all stored behind the scenes um in and there so you so you're not like for example ebs snapshots are all stored in amazon s3 but um but they're not but in a bucket that's owned by ebs by the ebs service not by you so you wouldn't be able to go into say your s3 bucket and see where your, what your ebs backups look like no they're, they're all kind of that's all behind the scenes stuff uh, Rio also asked, will this slide be available in Canvas? Yes, I will be sending out the slides um, afterwards. I'm not sure how they will be. I'll, I'll be uh, emailing this to the uh, to the restart team, and, and I'm sure they'll, sh they'll share. So, um, so let's see. So a couple other things I want to talk about with backup, right? So I was a partner solutions architect prior to my current role. Um, so AWS backup is one way to, to, to do backups, but, um, we also have partner solutions. We have storage partner solutions. So some of these, uh, names in the bottom right-hand corner may be, um, may, may be familiar to you, right? Things like Veritas, uh, names like Veritas, IBM, Dell EMC, they all have their own backup products, right? Um, some of them allow uh, customers to backup in AWS, but where we also see a lot of customers doing now is let's say they're not ready to move their entire workload to AWS or even all of it. They just don't want to get be in the tape business anymore, right? They don't want to back up to tape. They want to back up to AWS. Um, and it's just easier, it's cheaper, it's 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 it's, it's less less overhead. So a lot of our partner solutions uh, and, and partner, we, we have a, a thing called the Amazon Partner Network where these are basically software companies like Veritas and, and Dell EMC um, who partner with us to create joint solutions that will use AWS services. So many of these uh, or, or all of these partner solutions um, have been vetted, right? Um, at least the ones on this slide. Um, but um, but basically what these allow uh, folks to do is if you've got a on-premise presence, right? Like let's say you're backing up a whole bunch of virtual machines um, or NAS storage um, in your on-premise system, right? Whether it be in a local data center or an Equinix data center, you can use these products to back up to S3, right? And some of these also um, also offer the ability to recover in AWS. Uh, like Veeam, for example, allows customers to back up your on-prem VMware systems or Hyper-V systems and um, restore them to EC2 instances, uh, for example. So I just wanted to mention, you know, we, that this is more than just AWS backup. Um, so I also want to talk a bit about disaster recovery before we get into the demo, uh, because backup and disaster recovery, um, they're, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's kind of like, you know, two people on the same bench, um, you know, uh, but they're just going to different destinations that they're waiting for the bus and, and one will get off before the other one does. Right. So, uh, disaster recovery to me, um, is, is different than backup, right? Uh, not every, not everybody backs up disaster recovery and not everybody uses disaster, disaster recovery um, for backup. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, disaster recovery, depending on your recovery point objective, right? Um, we have a tool that I'm going I'm to go into now um, that allows you to replicate um, your on-premise systems, right? Or even EC2 instances within, within AWS, you can replicate these systems and it's block level replication. So you can get back, you can, you can roll back to a, to a system state 15 minutes uh, within, you know, from 15 minutes, generally within a 15 minute time window. So if something bad happens and, you know, if something bad were to happen right this moment and I needed to, uh, to flip over to a different region, assuming I had this disaster recovery piece uh, in place, um, I could I could do that, right? And it would be from no greater than 15 minutes ago, assuming I set it up that way, right? But that's different than a backup, right? Because it's gonna it's gonna get me to 15 minutes ago. But if for some reason I need to take a I need to restore something from a year ago, I'm not gonna use my disaster recovery solution to do that. I'm gonna go to my backup solution, right? Or if somebody just deletes a record in a table, right? I'm not gonna declare a disaster because somebody deleted a record in a table. No, I'm gonna restore that record from a backup. So there's some really nuanced differences is there um, and they're kind of laid out a slide but I want to talk about you know uh, one thing we have called elastic disaster recovery um, it's been rebranded you may also have heard it as cloud indoor disaster recovery um, this relates this is an agent-based solution that allows you to replicate from any source um, as long as they're x86 compatible for example right so we're not gonna you can't put this on a mainframe or an i series or something like that uh, but because it's block level right it doesn't really care what applications on there it's gonna whatever blocks are, are on the source it's going to replicate those blocks it doesn't care if oracle wrote it there 
if uh, a hello world application put it there or if it's just a whole bunch of notepad files or, or text files it doesn't matter it's going to replicate those change block blocks over uh, it's continuous it's non-disruptive uh, and allows you to have recovery points of uh, seconds apparently so um, and recovery times in minutes um, and it's not non-disruptive and requires and, and doesn't really require a lot and here's some use cases for why you might want to use something like elastic uh, elastic uh, disaster recovery on-premise to AWS DR, uh, cloud to AWS, if you're running something in say Azure and you wanna recover that to AWS, or even AWS region to region, right? I mean, it, EC2 doesn't have a native, uh, func uh, native functionality to be able to do real-time replication across regions. Yes, you can copy snapshots across regions, but uh, they're, they're just snapshots, they're, they're points in time. And if you're only taking snapshots once or twice a day, it may, it may not be enough for your business critical application. So here's kind of like what that process looks like in terms of you set up, you test, you operate, and you, you fail over, and then you, then you need your fail back. But I, I think where it really helps here is just in this, in this architectural diagram. So on the left-hand side here, you've got your data center, you've got your, your systems, um, whatever they are, they're, 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 they, you've got your systems uh, here attached to your disks, and you've got, your, you've got two replication agents that are sitting on, in, in your data center um, on, on, your, on the systems you wanna replicate. This is all continuous, and once you have this set up, it's all do, doing continuous block level replication that's compressed and encrypted. Uh, into AWS, and this is all in your, your your AWS account. It's not like a separate AWS account. This would all be yours or a customer's. So you've got a staging area subnet, and this is where your 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 um, replication destination is. Uh, and basically, what we use here is we use like these smaller, like these T2 small instances, and we use magnetic magnetic disks on the back end. Uh, and and the the advantage of this here is that all we really care about is we just care about a place to store the data and to have that it's a replication destination right if you were to declare a disaster and you needed to to uh, to actually fail over to another system or you just wanted to test uh that is when you would go into this service and say i want you know say okay um recover and that would create these recovery ec2 instances based on the data from the replication servers so why 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 is this helpful well because if you've got these really large if you've got the EC2 instances are paid by the hour, right? But we've got some EC2 instances that charge $4 an hour, right? Or even higher, $12 an hour or $12 an hour. And that adds up. So why have something just sitting out there doing nothing other than just tracking changes for four bucks an hour when you can have something for less than a dollar an hour sit out there, replicate those changes. And when the time comes for either testing or declaring that disaster, you're creating that, that production size instance based on that data. And that's where it really kind of kind of helps there. Um, so um, before I get while I get into the demo, um, any questions? Uh, feel free to throw them in the pr probably best to throw them in the in the chat window now while I'm uh, while I just get my my demo piece shown up. If not, I'll I'll take some at the end too. It doesn't really matter. Um, I need to figure out where my Firefox window is that has this. So what I've done here is I, I, I'm in my AWS management console now, and what this is really showing us is, so this is, this is what AWS backup looks like um, in my account. I've, I have this set up in the Ohio region to protect some of my resources. So we'll kind of go down the line here and we'll show you kind of what this dashboard looks like, right? So I've got, I've got a couple of resources here. I've got, a, I've got backups that run, um, that run, I've got some that run every, every 12 hours, um, but, um, we can see if there's anything in, anything in progress, what, what's completed, what's failed uh, for backup jobs, restore jobs, and copy jobs, right? Um, so I can show you here that I've got uh, I've got this this vault here. This is this is that logical construct that we were talking about er earlier. It's got its own KMS key here. I'm backing up Neptune databases. I'm backing up DynamoDB databases, Aurora databases. Um, and these are all the different recovery points that I have. So I've got some from today, uh, some from yesterday. And if I want to, uh, if, if I wanted to, to recover from this, I can go in here and I can just click restore. Like, like let's say something happens to my Neptune database. Um, I can, I, I can, or if I want to just grab a copy of my Neptune database from, from yesterday, 
I go in, I say restore, and I can go through the entire restore process. Now, um, like with RDS and EBS, I mean, you, you're, it's not going to, it's like with RDS, for example, it's going to create a new database, for example, right? So a new endpoint. So if you've got any applications pointing to it, you need to repoint them. Um, same thing with an EBS volume, right? If you're if you're recovering from an EBS volume, it would basically create a new volume based on that. So those are a couple things to to think about there. Um, I'm pretty sure I've got Vault Lock um, enabled here. So to test that, I'm going to go ahead and try and delete this recovery point. And it told me to go fish uh, because back configured lock. Um, so again, that's just showing kind of the power of this. Um, but again, with great power comes great responsibility. So don't don't have crazy um, you know, don't don't lock your vaults for for longer than they, they need to really have that come out based on uh, requirements of the customer you're working with or, or the business that you have. Now to talk a bit about the backup plan. So I've created a backup plan here and it's got these and what this is is going to show us the rules. You know, uh, what are the rules of this plan? What are we backing up? Um, if we've got any advanced settings. So um, this is kind of helping us with the schedule, uh, the, these rules here. So here you can see I'm backing everything up every 12, any, every, every 12 hours. Um, and I see that my chime is lagging, so sorry about that. So we've got an eight hour backup window. Um, you know, start it within, within eight hours. Uh, it's never gonna transition to cold storage and it'll expire those backups. After after 10 days. A uh, fun fact here about the expiration is um, I actually had my backups fail when I when I initially created Volt Lock when I did the Volt Lock, and the reason was because I've had my Volt Lock set up to where the all of my backups were locked for a minimum of seven days, but a maximum of 14 days, and I was expiring everything in 30 days. So because it felt because my expiration fell felt outside of the uh, of the Volt Lock window my backups failed and I had to make sure that my, that's why I changed the expiration to be 10 days within so the minimum of seven days and the maximum of 14 with my expiration policy. So just something to keep in mind if you're gonna start messing with vault lock, uh, make, sure that your, make, make sure that your vault lock uh, settings are in tune with your expiration setting on your, your backup policy. Um, I've also got these backups being copied to a different region, right? So uh, some customers may want, may feel a little warmer and safer knowing that their backups are sitting in a, in a different region. So um, these are being copied once they get created um, to the Oregon region, um, which is also very helpful. Um, and they never expire, um, which I should probably change because over the course of time, um, I'm going to start getting a nice large AWS bill because I just keep dumping backups out there. So, um, so that's that's those those are the rules, and then the resource assignments. So, how does AWS Backup work with resource assignments? So, there's two ways. I don't want to delete that. Um, there's two ways uh, to basically to assign resources to a backup policy, right? Um, and um, actually, that that's a different section here, but. Um, what we're going to show here is um, the resource, resource, resource assignments are down there. Um, I'm sorry about that. So, with the with these resource assignments, there's two ways to to do that. Um, you can either include all your resource types and be specific, right? So you can specify an RDS database or a DynamoDB table or a uh, EBS volume, right? And that may be fine for now, but over time, what that means is that Every time you add something new, you're going to have to go back to AWS Backup and say, okay, make sure you include this. Um, so a much easier way to do that is to make use of tags, right? So um, what we have here with this with this resource assignment policy, I've got this, I've got what it's called tag policy. Um, but basically, what this says is that if if I find if AWS Backup finds any supported resources that's tagged with the tag key of backup and the value being yes, it's going to back that up. So um, my RDS database I can show you it's got a tag you know the the, the key is backup and uh, the value is yes and it'll back that up. So as long as you have that tag on there, um, AWS Backup is is going to back is is going to back that up. That's a lot easier than have, having to go back and forth and say okay let me edit that. Um, because what you don't want is drift over time, right? So um, that's that becomes a no-no. Where uh, I mean, uh, having having AWS backup set up is great, but if you aren't backing up the systems you care about, um, 
then you know, it's, it's kind of, of of no use to you. So that's where I think tag tag based backups, um, you know, kind of using tags to assign resources is, is very powerful uh, with that. Um, we can also set up that Windows VSS and that helps us with some of that application consistency um, that we talked about before in terms of classing databases and whatnot. And this is just showing me my protected resources. So if for some reason I wanted to go into my Neptune database and just see all the all the snapshots that I had there. Um, if I wanted to browse for some and say, okay, let me go find one from from the from the beginning here, from the first of February, I can go there, I can pick that and restore it, for example, right? Um, there's you know this this there's a next piece here which talks about the jobs, and then then the settings themselves um, as well. So if I want to opt in to, to specific services, this isn't this is something that. Um, for the most part, should be should all be enabled. I, I think the, um, there was you know, where the real enablement came from is uh, there were some legacy accounts that didn't have all these enabled. So if you've got an older account, it's always good to go in here and just make sure it's 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 good. Um, but we've also got a cross account management piece here, and this goes back to if you're using organizations with control, you know, with or without control tower, you know, this this helps with that cross account. Um, uh, management to where you don't have to go. If you've got 100 accounts, you've got don't have to go into a uh, you don't have to go into AWS backup for 100 accounts. Um, this can kind of help you um, with that as well. So with that said, um, what I can do here is show you know just kind of show what a resource what a, what a restore would look like. Let's pick let's pick on Neptune just because it's a cool sounding name. We'll, we'll restore this recovery. Uh, this latest recovery point, and um, it'll take us through this restore scenario. Um, the restore is, you know, again, this is why you test, right? Um, re restoring databases um, isn't, although it takes it just takes a couple of clicks to do this. Um, you know, you can, um, it, and that's just to kick off the restore. Uh, it takes takes a few seconds, but it will take sometimes minutes, sometimes multiple minutes, and that's why you want to test, right? Because if you really do need uh, five minutes or less uh, to to restore a, a Neptune database, you might want to be thinking about some alternatives to something like AWS Backup. But we'll call this cluster, cluster tests, restore. Um, I'm going to leave all these defaults. Um, I could select the default encryption key, default role, make, and boom. Now it's going and it's restoring. Um, you know, and, and again, it it may take um, it's probably going to take some time to restore that database, um, especially you know with with RDS for example or Neptune, right? If you restore something from say weeks or months ago, what usually happens is you restore the database, but then it may have to uh, apply some patches, right? Because it's a managed service, it may have some patches it wants to um, that it needs to apply in order to get it current. Uh, but if we take a quick look into our database, our RDS database instances here, uh, we'll see, for example, like Aurora database. Um, I just want to take a look at the tags and kind of show you, you know, how this is kind of laid out from a tagging perspective. So there's that, there's that tag key of backup and that value of yes, um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, this is this is pretty intuitive stuff. Uh, there's also a lot of blogs on the topic for AWS backup. Um, if you're interested, um, it's a, you know, it's something in, in my, we just, unfortunately customers think about this like last for, for whatever reason, especially born in the cloud customers, right? If, if you've got a customer who's, who's been on-prem for a while, I mean, backups are kind of ingrained in their in their operational mentality, but, you know, for, for some startups, you know, data protection, backups, resiliency, um, you know, outside of like application level high availability, things like backing up state uh, isn't always top of mind. So I, I think it goes a long way just to start challenging that and saying, hey, what's your backup strategy for this like if you're working with a customer? How are you backing it up? Have you considered that? Have you tested it? Right. Uh, if not, let's, you know, let, let's have that conversation. Um, that's really all I had um, for this. Um, is there anything anybody would like to see? Anything you'd like to discuss? Anything I didn't cover? Um, I'm I'm very much an open book and happy to share um, all of my um, 
hard-earned scores um, you know, with, with the group here. Um, so feel free to just throw it in the chat window, take yourself off mute, um, whatever you like. Going once, going twice. I'll take silence as a as a no, uh, but hopefully this was helpful. Uh, James, I yeah, see. I, you I, I did. I did have something. Uh, you sure. had a slide, and I, you know, I'm trying to go back on my notes to find it. Sure. But you had a slide where you had on premises, and it was replicating uh, blocks in real time into the cloud. And about then, this slide? Mm, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. So okay. my question sure. is here, you know, you're replicating into the slide and then, yep. oh, it disappeared. There it goes. You're replicating into yeah. the slide, into the yep. slide. Can you hear me? Good. And sure yep. then something happens and you need yep. to recover and you mm -hmm. need to recover. So what's it doing in the recovery? So here in the middle section, staging area subnets, you have yep. the blocks where the blocks are being stored. Yep. So what happens when it recovers? Sure. What does it do in, in the sure. right side? So what's happening is, so so this uh, under norm, when you're just replicating, this recovery subnet exists, but the recovery instance doesn't, right? So this would be like your production subnet, right? So you would create this subnet ahead of time to run your production instances, right? And these, uh, when you're just replicating these recovery, this would probably be like a three-step slide, right? Like set up, replication and then recovery right because when you're just replicating these recovery instances aren't um, aren't running these recovery instances run when you tell them to run when you say okay now I need to recover and you select your recovery point and then that's creating those these recovery instances based on the data that's on the replication servers so these replication servers it's not a one-to-one -one thing so normally what we'll see is a replication server will handle generally around five uh, source systems. So you may have, if you've got, tw if you've got 10 on-premise systems, you might have two replication servers, right? But, um, and, and that's more for cost reasons than anything else. They're right. just acting as that pilot light. When disaster co time co comes, you want to recover all 10 of those instances, and those are all going to sit in this recovery subnet um, because that's where all your all your magic happens. Does that make more sense? And apologies if that was a good call out, by the way. Yeah, so again, apologies. let me try to summarize it, see if sure. you think I understand. So the replication, sure. you just have a bunch of these volumes and you're just putting blocks on these volumes. You That's know, it. there's yeah. no real order to it. You're keeping track of it, but you're just piling them in and filling them up. Correct. But then yes. when you need to recover, you need to sort all that out and put the right blocks onto the right volume so you can actually use it, correct? That, that is correct, yeah, with the right blocks, right volumes, and, and right instances, right? And, and the nice part about this is, you, you know, the, ser you, you worry, the service worries about that, right? So when you're, when you're in the service itself, you're just saying, okay, which is the server I want to recover? What's the recovery point I want to recover from? And where is it going to be recovered into in terms of like the subnet, right? So um, there's a couple more bells and whistles there, but you kind of let us worry about it. So if your recovery point is from 15 minutes ago or 15 hours ago, for example, right, you kind of let the service figure out, you know, where it's got to draw those blocks from. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's essentially, you, you, you hit the nail essentially on the head there. If that makes sense. Now, now this all started in the data center. It said data center or cloud. If yeah, it is it in your data be. center, what are you going to yep. do? Now you've got all these volumes recovered in the cloud. What do you do then? So that's a that's a great question. So uh, so uh, you would basically need to point your production traffic so or or point your users to that, right? So so if your data center is gone, for example, right? And this is where planning and testing come into play, right? So doing a DR test, saying okay, if we assume that our data center is gone, right? How are my users going to connect to these recovered instances now in AWS? Um, do we have to update DNS entries? Where is DNS going, right? Um, who, who owns DNS? Is it sitting on a? Is it is, is it sitting on a, an Active Directory server somewhere? Is it hosted somewhere else? Um, so yes, you'll want to make sure that all that plumbing is in place. And again, that that goes back to my earlier point of just test, uh, but also plan, right? To make sure that because uh, just having a bunch of servers spinning in the cloud without a route to get there, 
and without users even knowing that they exist, it's kind of useless, right? <laughs> so uh, they're just kind of spin spinning at, at spinning around at their own volition. Uh, but no, it's a great point. Really good great. point. Well, well, thanks. We just did a, a session on Route 53, so we know how to do ah, that yes. too now. Yeah, there yeah, you go. So, so that, that, that's, we're, that's we're all up spot. to speed. This is great, and thank you so much for your time today. You did a great oh, job. Gosh. Awesome. Really appreciate that feedback. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I am just about out of time. I want to thank you all very much uh, for your time. Um, you guys are, are awesome. Um, and yes, I'm going to, you know, you're not just going to get slides from me. I'm going to talk a lot. And I'm, I'm going to, um, I forget my point of context name, but I'm going to, I'm going to shoot a whole heck of a lot of information your way. Just so both on AWS backup, uh, our elastic disaster recovery and just backup in general, just so you guys have something for the that you can refer back to. So, um, it's important stuff. Appreciate it, guys. Hey, thanks, Anthony. This is Raj. Uh, so you can yep. please share the slides, uh, you know, yep. and other information with me, and I can make sure that this reaches to the learners. You bet. I'll probably do that later on tonight after all my calls. So, awesome. Um, awesome. So oh, cool. Hey, everyone, real, 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 real pleasure. Um, thanks for, thanks for your continued interest in AWS. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. So. Take care, everyone. All the best. All Thank right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.